Hi, everybody. Eve Harrow on Rejuvenation for the Land of Israel Network. And I am sitting right now with Dr. Dania Fleischer. Yes, the mother of, but we're not going to talk about him unless we get to an embarrassing story at some point during the interview. Um, lovely, lovely woman who I have been honored to meet on occasion. And I would love this, actually, to be the first of a series because... Dr. Fleischer has a lot to say about many, many things. So we'll see how we can work that in. Maybe you should even have your own show. We should talk about that. Anyway, so thank you so much for joining me today in Jerusalem. Hi. Uh, so uh, I was uh, about to, to, to tell you a little bit about growing up in, uh, in St. Petersburg, Russia, because um, I guess most of the English speakers here in Israel kind of don't know how how was it like on the other side of the uh, Iron Curtain. Right. Well, I remember we had the whole campaign. I grew up in Los Angeles. I wore Silva Zamlinson uh, bracelet on my wrist for quite a few years until the Soviet Union opened its gates. But you're going to talk to us a little bit, and I have listeners from all over the world, about what it was like on the other side of those gates. Right. So um, actually it wasn't so bad at all. I uh, grew up in uh, the, one of the most beautiful cities uh, uh, of Europe, uh, where it had a tremendous amount of art and music and uh, museum. And my father was very much into arts, so uh, like it, we used to go every weekend uh, for uh, uh, you know to the Hermitage. It was like home. I was there a few years ago with my husband. We were on a cruise and it stopped there. We were there for only three hours. I said I could have spent months there. What an unbelievable museum. So it was one of my most exciting moments of my life was when I brought um, my son, Ishai, not an embarrassing story, to, uh, you know, to see the Hermitage Museum. And uh, regretfully, the, uh, the famous uh, staircase was uh, under restoration, so we didn't see that. But we saw the huge collection of Rembrandt and all the Jewish uh, themes of, of his painting. Uh, so, uh, I mean, life wasn't bad. Then I, 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 I went to school, which uh, was the school that, I, that um, was opened up li- like the year when I en- entered in. It was uh, like, like a special math- a mathematical, f- phys- physics mathematics school by the uh, St. Petersburg University, which was great. And then I started at the university itself. Uh, which was also uh, those times was uh, absolutely amazing. Now, can, Jewish... can I can I shut the window? Is that okay? Because I just think some of the outside noise. Sure. Yeah. Ahead. Okay. Sorry. No, no. We'll cut this part out. Obviously, Ben. We'll cut this part out. Always thinking of you, Ben. And background noise. That's there. We go. Much better. Okay, we just shut the window, so a little bit of less of the Jerusalem noise is coming into the apartment. Yes, so the university. So that was a time already after the big repressions. So it wasn't so frightening as it used to be at the time when my parents were growing up. What do you mean about the big repression? Uh, like uh, 37, like 1937, and all the time when... Uh, uh, when uh, like people were like disappearing and uh, and going to jail for many many years for for absolutely nothing for saying a wrong uh, like joke or, or for uh, using a newspaper for like wrong purpose with a portrait of Stalin or stuff like this. So in my time, uh, the uh, the things were much much easier, and that's actually what led to all this opening, because when people are very repressed, they don't, as we know from our Jewish sources, when the people are very repressed, they cannot really, uh, like, revolt. Mm -hmm. When there is a little easing of the repression, so that's when these thoughts of freedom, you know, come to people's mind. So from the Jewish point of view, life was empty. I didn't know what is Pesach, I knew that it was connected to the matzah. Hmm. I didn't know what kosher is. And uh, basically, we, I, I never saw the Tanakh in my life. Hmm. And uh, so um, my grandparents spoke Yiddish. And actually, my grandfather 
spoke new Hebrew. He went to school, but then I learned uh, it. I, I learned la uh, later, but uh, we were very, very conscious Jews. I mean, I knew I, I knew that we are Jews, and uh, well, knowing nothing about basically history and uh, and language and uh, because she's, I knew that I cannot marry not a Jew. Really. That this was one thing, I knew absolutely, and nobody told me that, but it was just in the atmosphere of the house. That was not a possibility for mm -hmm. me. Do you have so, siblings? I'm the only child. That was common, right? To have very small that families. That was very common. Yeah. That was very common. Like two two children was a big family. Mm -hmm. So, uh, um, so um, my grandparents. Uh, used to meet with, they had many siblings, and they used to meet, and now coming back, I think that those were the maybe Jewish holidays, maybe it was Rosh Hashanah or something like that, but they never told us. But they would, uh, at the, uh, after the dinner, they would open up the book of Sholem Aleichem in Yiddish, I don't know where they got it, and they read it. Hmm. And I remember they laughing, laughing like crazy, and, and the eyes lit, and it was like it's such a terrible, such a tremendous joy. I kind of always kind of sense that there is something very uh, pleasurable about mm -hmm. like about being. And I was curious uh, uh, about all these things. My uh, so one time at age six, this is a record that's in my family. I somehow went to my grandfather and asked him to teach me alphabet, the Hebrew alphabet. Okay. Yeah. I told this story to a couple of rabbis. They said, oh, Pintaliyit. Pintaliyit, you know. Uh -huh. A little Jew. A little Jew. Just woke up. Uh, mm -hmm. My grandfather happily taught me. And we talked. And he did study in the Cheder or something. He, he was educated. He was an economist. Can we stop for a second? Yeah, of course. <coughs> Okay. Want to take a sip of something? Yeah. Take yeah, a sip. Yeah. Okay. Is it? Then Ben will cut it out. We have a great editor. Is no, it? Yeah. It's running. Okay. It's fine. So, uh, so in the universe, uh, we were very curious about Kol uh, Israel. Now, oh, the Israel, the, big, the radio station the, at the Israel time, the, mm -hmm. the, the voice big, of Israel. The big culture in my circles was to listen to the foreign radio stations. It was a culture, an art, uh, the, you know, the technical abilities, because Russia actually jammed all the radio stations. Hmm. So there was Voice of America, there was Radio Freedom, and there was Kol Israel. And we always tried to do it. My father bought some fancy Japanese uh, little ra uh, like radios we were able to, to listen to it. Oh, always very hard, but we did it. So we knew what was going on. Mm -hmm. And those times in Russia, nobody really believed in communists, practically nobody. And we all learned to read between the lines. So, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, so I uh, um, remember that we had uh, once, we had in the university a lot of foreign students. And I once had a foreign student in my house uh, with us, we were watching TV, and they showed uh, the terrible sh like pictures of Israeli, and they said that these are Israelis uh, like beating up in such a cruel way, like poor little Arabs mm -hmm. there. And the guy looked at this and said, but those are not Israelis. <laughs> These are British in Yemen. Because he identified the pom-poms on their heads, on, right. on their caps, he said, they're not Israelis at all. Mm -hmm. This is like the level of lies, like... like right. well, isn't it terrific that things have changed since then? Not really, but yes, really. okay. What year is this about? We're talking about, I guess, a year like just before 67, like mm -hmm. maybe 66, maybe 67. Mm -hmm. And then the war came, the 67. 
And the 67 war was amazing, was invigorating to all the Jews to an unbelievable degree. So you knew about it, even with all the censorship? Yes, we knew. The ra- Russian stations, you know, said we, like, but, but what we knew is what uh, the, Arabs, uh, st- uh, the, the Arabs news station said. Mm-hmm. So what we knew is that the Egyptians are coming to, to Tel Aviv and, uh, and uh, Jordanians are, I don't know, bombing Jerusalem, whatever. And then all of a sudden, one day, it turned out that it's completely wrong. And uh, it was an unbelievably invigorating, like... Uh, uh, it, it was like an electricity in the air. All of a sudden, Jews figured out that they are Jews. Wow. And, uh, yeah, so that was a time when uh, I went to study. I, uh, I was in university. I went to study Hebrew in university. They were teaching Hebrew at the yeah, university was, in the Soviet Union? There was a, a, Russia has a very long history of uh, uh, Oriental studies. We know here in Jerusalem there is a mm-hmm. lot of uh, like uh, a lot of uh, you can, you know Russian you can see Russian presence and there were very famous Oriental studies professors Kluchevsky and uh, so in, in the uh, University of Leningrad there was a faculty of Oriental languages and I was uh, as a student of university had the right to take any classes whenever I wanted to without credit if it didn't interfere with my uh, schedule. And it didn't. And I took my classes in Hebrew. And uh, I uh, we studied from Tanakh. Wow. <laughs> like, that's the first time I saw, you, you know, like, not Tanakh books, but right. Tanakh like pages. And uh, that was like a very, very interesting and exciting st- uh, stuff. Then I met amazing people. Professor Vinikov was teaching, and uh, I came to him and I said, Professor, I want to transfer here. I love it here. I love history. I want language. I want to transfer. And he looked at me and said, Jenichka. He was a Jewish professor. Mm-hmm. He said, Jenichka, you like history? Read books. Hmm. Wow. So in the so you didn't transfer to, no. you stayed you in chemistry that's yes, where your doctorate is yes, uh-huh. yes. so I, I stayed with chemistry I'm so grateful to Professor Vinikov to my and to my father and all the people that uh, that can kind of uh, made me stay with uh, with, with like real things mm-hmm. as they call it in Russia like right. the sciences the hard the sciences, sciences yeah. right. so so that 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 was it and then there was like a whole story with um, with the Zionist organization that uh, I don't want to get into it because there are many books written about it over mm-hmm. it and many people uh, wrote it but uh, uh, well, how did you meet your husband within that group no my husband I met uh, in uh, school in university and, uh, even mm-hmm. before university I met him in school and he was all into chemistry. He was not as like political in those times. Well, but uh, yeah, we were friends uh, forever, mm-hmm. kind of forever. And uh, then we were uh, together in uh, in university, like in a di- different um, like department, mm-hmm. but also within chemistry. And uh, and then I kind of got very much into the Zionist stuff. And uh, with God's help, uh, I was able to leave the country with uh, very, uh, like a few first kind of, uh, uh, like first birds of the Russian Aliyah. And I came straight to Haifa. Uh-huh. And uh, what year was this when you left and came to Haifa? I think of 70s, mm-hmm. like 71, I think. Mm-hmm. 72. So before the Yom Kippur War? Before the Yom Kippur War. The Yom Kippur War, I was here. Uh-huh. So you left your parents behind and you left Sasha, your husband? Yeah. Behind? He wasn't your husband yet. No. Uh-huh. So uh, Sasha uh, came after uh, me. It's very, like, in a. Uh, yeah, 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 Sasha came in a couple of years. 
after that. He came after the war, mm -hmm. after Yom Kippur War. So they were letting some people out, just like little trickles here and there? After the, the, um, the plane, uh, the, tri the trial of the plane, Samalot mm Neidela, -hmm. they let a lot of people out. But uh, we're talking about hundreds, maybe like Tens. Yeah. sounds. There was always Aliyah. There was always trickle of Aliyah. It was coming mostly from uh, uh, from um, Latvia, uh, Baltic republics. Mm -hmm. Because those people, many of them had real relatives in Israel. abroad. But the, the difference is that... Uh, Th that Aliyah was personal. It was not never as a group. Mm -hmm. People wanted to to like uh, to, to uh, join their families. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a political statement of Zionism. It wasn't a Zionism. political statement mm -hmm. in, in no way. Now in my time, that was uh, the Aliyah was a, was a, it's a poli was a movement. It was a political movement. It was like a um, I, I was kicked out of. Uh, Young Com Komsomol League, Young uh, Communist League, uh -huh. uh, from university well, it was like a whole, whole, whole big thing. It was like a, it, it it was a movement. It was a political movement. And when we came here, when we heard Russian without accent, <laughs> we hugged on the streets. There were very few of us, wow. and uh, so. Uh, my closest friends are from those times when we, like, uh, I remember I got on the bus uh, for some kind of a trip, I think to the Negev, and they told me there is another girl from Leningrad. Yeah. So I came into the bus and said, who is a girl from Leningrad? She said, yeah, it's, uh, so she's still one of my closest friends. Wow. Yes, and uh, at those times, this girl's father, her name, his name was Cyrulnikov. He was pronounced the citizen number three million. Of, is of Israel. Of Israel. Wow. Of Israel. So in my lifetime, the population of Israel right. practically tripled. Wow. That's amazing. That's, right? We're at eight and a half million now. Amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. Yes, and it was uh, the country was uh, small, but uh, very, very electrified by the by, by the war. Mm -hmm. uh, my uh, s uh, son is in law father came to Israel in sixty five wow. from Lithuania, and when we were talking, he told me stories about. Uh, what happened to his family in Israel? And I told him, I do not recognize it. I do mm -hmm. not recognize it. I don't know what country you're talking about. Mm -hmm. I never lived there. I, I don't know what is it. I asked him, when did it change? He said, 67. Right. After 67, it was like a different country. Right. So the big I, miracle of the 6 6 day war. So when I came there, it was, uh, it was a huge country. Mm -hmm. It was... Uh, like the Yudav Shamron right. and Sinai. Yeah. So Sinai became our home. The Sinai Desert. The Sinai yeah. Desert. We went there at least twice a year. Ishai used to think that uh, in Sinai there is, uh, the, moon is always, the moon is always full. <laughs> because we went there every Sukkot and every Pesach. Right. Our holidays are holidays. in the middle of the, the Jewish it, month when there's a full yeah, moon. So the first time we took our son Ishai to Sinai, he was one year old. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, we went to Sinai beaches. We went uh, inside. We were friendly with, uh, with, with the Bedouin in Sinai, with the Tarabin tribe. People we had friends in Sinai. Like, like it was like uh, we lived for Sinai. We lived for the time of the, when we'll go there, at least twice a year, even more. I can't tell you what was it for for us when we gave up Sinai. Right, the peace <laughs> treaty with Egypt, seventy-eight, seventy-nine, yeah. eighty-two. We leave Sinai. Life, 
the life that was developed here, I, I, there are very few people that remember that. For instance, there was Tehanat uh, Delet Nueva. The gas station in Nueva. I don't know where you heard about it. So I was in school at Hebrew University from 79 to 80, and I must say that I spent most of the year in the Sinai Desert and not in class because it was magic. And now it's fortunately, it's terror central, but the place was absolutely magic. And my mother had a good friend who lived in Yamit, which was later destroyed. And uh, I won't go back there now since 82. It just hurts me too much to go back. Even those Israelis can. Right. So like, yeah, so so you know what I'm talking about. It's just took part of my life. Mm -hmm. When we returned to Sinai uh, with Sasha and with all the kids, we did once... uh, this trip, which we called Yitziat Misraim. Leaving, leaving Egypt, like what we did yeah, on the so, Passover so, Seder. It, yeah. We did it on Passover. Mm-hmm. Actually, before Passover, we flew from uh, America. We lived in America those times. We flew from America to Cairo. Mm-hmm. We like spent time in Cairo like to get acquainted to the uh, like Egyptian culture. And... Uh, the kind of Egyptian culture that our forefathers saw. Right. You can still see it. In. Not it's the Arab standard. culture that not has Egypt. taken over Egypt now. No, That's no, not no, Egypt no. of the olden days. No, and uh, we went uh, from there, like we t- took a taxi, across the, uh, across the, the, there is a channel crossing under, mm-hmm. like the tunnel under the, the channel. We uh, went to South and we, tr- we tried to follow the route as much as we know. And uh, we went to uh, to the uh, to, to Sinai, and then we uh, to the mountain to, right. to, to, to uh, Santa Caterina, uh, where they we think right. Jebel Musa that Jebel maybe Musa, yes. was and, uh, the giving and then of the we Torah. Came back to uh, to to area which is called uh, Ras, Shay- Ras Shaitan, which we used to love and stay there a lot. I couldn't like I'm not. A, crying person at all. My daughter just told me that she doesn't remember me ever crying. But I got hysterical. Hmm. I, I I couldn't hold my I completely couldn't control myself. Like it it it's like they it, it, it's like part of me. It's like I'm crippled by uh, losing uh, you know mm-hmm. it's it's one of my organs they took away from me. So yeah, so that was Sinai, and then yes, uh, yeah, Israel, yeah, and then we uh, we burned our chametz <laughs> in the uh, Le- the leavened bread. You leavened burnt it in bread. Sinai, yes, we, uh, and the, at uh, the Wadi Fara, which mm-hmm. is a biblical border of uh, Eretz Israel, and by Erev Pesach we were in Yerushalayim. Wow, that was a story. It didn't take you forty years. It's like a little bit less. So when did you leave Israel and go to the States? <clears throat> and why? Why? Just get to stop. Okay. We're good. <coughs> it's, it's okay. My, he'll cut it out. It's my... Uh, Your pneumonia. Mm-hmm. Ben will be fine. So we, we um, left Israel in 85. 85. And uh, my uh, Sasha, has, my, my husband Sasha had some uh, problems here with uh, his, uh, he worked in Mahon Vulcani and he had some problems with his co-workers mm-hmm. and uh, his co-workers weren't very uh, civilized. Mm-hmm. And uh, so he was offered a job in America. So we figured I just, I, I had a very, I had a great job. It was, uh, I, I worked in the Hekera Yamim, the Agamim, actually the best job of my life. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what, re- the marine research? Yes. Wow. Yeah. And uh, I had a commute there. Even had tenure. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Wow. But you left. But I left. It's uh, what, uh, Regretfully, many women do. Right. Like, Maybe it's different now, but in those days, you would follow your husband's work and yeah. yours wouldn't be a priority. Well, anyway, yeah. it works out okay for us. So we figured we're going for a couple of years, like almost everybody else. Mm. 
And we stayed for 30 years. Wow. My husband, Allah Shalom, died in America. He's buried here in Haram and Nukhot, and according to his wishes, in a beautiful place with amazing view. I think, uh, so now we are all here. Right. Whole family is here in Eretz Israel, including my, uh, our dad, my mother, Aleha Shalom, is also buried here. Did and your parents father, come out of the Soviet Union uh, after you? came out of the Soviet Union. My father came uh, to Israel, and uh, he lived here all these years, and my mother came to America, and uh, she kind of helped me raise my children, and uh, she was uh, she was very happy, and she loved America, and uh, she never thought about being buried in uh, in Israel. But my son, Ishai, told me, Mama, you will never come to her grave. Mm-hmm. And uh, yes, so, she's here too. so like she's here too. And uh, um, my husband's parents are buried in Canada, and the truth is that we never go to their graves. Right. Now, now in, in Isha is going to to be in Toronto for some time, so so we'll go. Mm-hmm. But nobody goes to Toronto right. just to visit the graves. Right. So that was very good thought and I'm very happy about it. So how did you end up staying for 30 years when it was just going to be two? He got a great job. Where were you? Where, which part of the state? Uh, New Jersey. We stayed in New Jersey. We uh, first we got good jobs. Mm-hmm. It's in America. We got you jobs. We bought a good house. We, uh, um, we, we also uh, became uh, um, religious in America. Ah, how did that happen? It actually started here in Israel, because when Ishai was born, I, out of the blue, said, you know what, I think he should never try unkosher food. Actually, unkosher meat, I meant. Mm-hmm. Because, like, the whole idea of kosher was like pretty vague for me in those times, like for all of us Russians. But, uh, yeah, so we kind of... Started that, and when we came to America, uh, we rented an apartment in the city of Passaic. Mm, so we sent Ishai to Jewish school, naturally, because not because of the religion, because uh, because we wanted him uh, to keep his Hebrew. Mm-hmm. There are only religious schools. So one of the uh, teachers in that school was uh, mm, Rebison Weissman, very prominent family in, in, in Basang that became my good and close friend. And uh, one time she saw me um, pregnant with a little baby in my hand, and Isha like holding another <laughs> hand, in the winter time going uh, down the icy uh, stairs, like to t- take Isha to the car, to take Isha to the school. She looked at this picture and said, you know what, I'm going to the school anyway, so I'll take him. Mm-hmm. And that's how we got friendly. And then I, uh, we bought a house uh, in a way better, from our point of view, neighborhood, and uh, we were about to take Isha from the school. And she told me, you can't do that. You don't know what you're doing. I said, yeah, no, we have our budget. We have like a whole idea. It's a beautiful place, a beautiful school. He has to go through the forest. It's lovely. It's uh, romantic, whatever. And she said, you don't know what you're doing. Come to the school. We'll talk to the, uh, with the school um, principal. To keep him in the Jewish school. Yeah. No, to keep us ah. like aware of what's going on. Yes, to keep him to the Jewish school, but you know they had to persuade us. Sasha didn't come. I came. I came, and they talked to me, and they explained to me that uh, I'm going to lose him. He's like public school, like in the best public school. Like it's uh, you know intermarriage, the whole mm-hmm. kind of stuff. 
And I said, you know, like I grew up, and then I'm okay in a situation like that. And then they told me, um, what would take it for you to keep him in a Jewish school? So I started to talk I, in, in a way which I thought is understood well by Americans, money. Mm -hmm. So I was like, you know, we, we just bought a house and these things and... Uh, uh, the tuition, because the first year tuition is free for new immigrants, was free. Oh. But the second year is already like... So I started to explain, like, uh, we kind of um, uh, stressed a little bit for mommy. So she kind of, her eyes lit up and she said, so it's a money problem? She said, we'll make a collection. <laughs> she told me, I will be the first to give. Wow. And I knew how they live. She had, at the time, I think, eight children. The house was falling apart. Like, they were, not, let's put it, not rich. Mm -hmm. When she said something like that, I thought, wow, I, they probably know something that I don't know. They saw some potential. They know. They knew some. So, yeah, so I told them, not only they, so I told them, but there have been many Russian kids that they took away from school. They said, yes, but... We don't want to shy to go. Hmm. And, I would say it was a good investment, huh? Looking back. <laughs> I, uh, yes, and uh, I came home and said, Sasha, they know something we don't know. Mm -hmm. I trust these people. And they found for us a different school when there was a busing. Mm -hmm. And it uh, was Kushner School. Ah. And now it's very famous. Right, right. And uh, that's uh, uh -huh. so the kids, so. The kids went to Jewish schools, so they never like uh, uh, from the from the kindergarten. Mm -hmm. All the kids. So, and you and your husband got more involved in Jewish we life. Got more involved, and we got to know Rabbi uh, Yudin, mm -hmm. who was uh, like he had a whole t tense of r Russians. It kind of. Uh, and I had um, many other rabbis that had been very, very helpful and, uh, and studied with us and taught us and uh, the Weisman family and many other like families to whom I'm very grateful and, uh, and uh, I feel very lucky that uh, we kind of, it, it all worked out. And, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, like all my kids are... Uh, and I are uh, like all, really, all my kids are religious and all married to Jews. My daughter is married to Rabbi the Baruch Hashem. Right. Wow. And we all live here, which is uh, like many, many of my friends have like, and I live like that for years. That we have like part of the family on mm -hmm. one side of the ocean and the other part of the family on the other side of the ocean. But now we are very lucky. We are all here. Mm -hmm. Wow. So when did your husband pass away? The, on a different show, I have to tell my listeners, we're going to get into more of the um, professional side of the Fleischers and some of the really incredible things that they did way before a lot of other people with chemistry and with Zatar and with all kinds of things. So this, this show, I just kind of wanted to focus a little bit more on the personal life. So when did your husband pass away? Uh, Sasha passed away in... Uh... 2002. Mm -hmm. Long time. Yeah. Uh, just after the um, uh, after the uh, the attack of the twin towers. Wow. We saw it like he's from his place of work. I watched it. I watched it like. Uh, not on TV, but... Uh, real, real live, out real the window. Wow. And uh, we, in the evening, we looked at each other and we said, you know, we were always wondering how this civilization will start to fall. And probably we're watching it now. The beginning of the end? The, of the fall of mm. this great civilization. I don't know whether we're right or not, but uh, definitely it's a crisis mm -hmm. of this civilization. Yeah, so Sasha died in, uh, from heart attack at the wedding of our close friend. Hmm. He was dancing at the wedding, and he felt 
kind of weak. And uh, he went to the site, and Josh saw him. Uh, uh, the, the wedding was in, in, in the shul, kind of. And uh, he saw him open the sidur. The prayer book. Mm -hmm. And uh, he looked... Uh, so, uh, Josh looked over his shoulder and saw that he was looking at the Shema. The hero Israel, the Shema Israel prayer, which is the prayer and also what you should or can, if you have the presence of mind to do so, should be the last thing that you say um, before you pass away. And a couple of minutes after that, he just fell. And I was on the other side of the... Uh, of the of the hall, and uh, they said that somebody fell. I immediately knew that it's him. I don't know how, hmm. so I ran. Uh, uh, yeah, um, I uh, I have this strange thing, and uh, lately I don't remember anything. I remember anything, everything before. I don't remember well all the events of uh, that followed. Mm -hmm. uh, the, I remember that in a car he asked me for forgiveness. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, in ambulance. Mm -hmm. But I don't remember many. It's very vague for me, like in a, uh, like uh, not clear. Many times the kids were there, so many times I asked kids to remind me what happened, and they tell me, and I remember, and then I forget again. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, but I remember very clearly everything happened before. Just, uh, just a, like a few days ago, I read an article of like Israeli army a psychiatrist analyzing uh, uh, the uh, Dr. Ford like statement. Mm -hmm. And he said that people that have... Uh, the kind of uh, po uh, like traumatic s uh, syndrome, they remember very well everything that happened before. Mm -hmm. So he was very suspicious about her because she didn't remember. Oh, oh you're talking about the Kavanaugh, the Kavanaugh trial. trial. Right, and she's, so she wasn't so, acting like a traumatized person yeah, would like, with her exactly, memories. Yeah, and I, mm -hmm. I read it and I said, exactly. You know, I remember... I remember what I wore. I remember how we drove there. Mm -hmm. I remember like Sasha's hand on the on the wheel, like like all the details. Mm -hmm. And from the moment he fell, it's all in the, for me in the like in the, in a cloud. Like foggy, yeah, mm -hmm. very foggy. So mm -hmm. it's like a little bit. Yeah. So yes, and then uh, and then the kids were in uh, like in school in universities and. Uh, I uh, remember that I said to myself that the worst thing that can happen to me is like to have a sad house of the widow. So I try not to do it, and uh, we did well. And by the way, very grateful to Columbia University that uh, I didn't ask them for anything. I was just not in the mood to think about it. But uh, when they learned that Sasha died, they just sent, uh, gave Rachel uh, a scholarship. Wow. So that's where he was working at Columbia? How were you connected to Columbia? Uh, my daughter, Rachel, mm -hmm. was accepted in Columbia. Oh. And, that, and so yeah. when they heard that her father had passed away, they gave her a scholarship. Wow. Yep. That's pretty impressive. Not Hebrew Universe. Uh, not, uh, <laughs> sorry, not, uh, not, not Tishu Universe. Right. No. <laughs> no. Okay. Uh, yeah. But. Uh, yeah, so that's what happened. So we stayed uh, much longer because kids uh, were in universities. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then the boys, after Sasha, the, the year Sasha died, Ishai left mm -hmm. to Israel. Mm -hmm. Then uh, the year my mother died, <laughs> Josh left to Israel. But uh, Rachel we had to finish her, my daughter had to finish her PhD in Colombia. And when she did, we all came back. Mm -hmm. And now you're here in Jerusalem and still busy. I'm so busy. And still busy. Yeah. Okay. So this was the Getting to Know Dr. Genya Fleischer episode. And um, 
when we have more time and also she hasn't been feeling well, so I don't want to press her voice, I'm going to come back and we're going to get into some of the, uh, the more scientific or the professional aspects of your life, which I've heard a little bit about from your kids, a little bit from you, which I find like completely fascinating. Okay. Right, right. Yeah, but a lot of the things other people are doing things, I think, based on some of your work. Mm-hmm. So it's important for my listeners to understand that also. But I want to thank you for taking the time today uh, to tell us a little bit about your life experience, which I think um, not very many people know this background of Yishai. And, um, and he's very beloved to all of us. And I can see here not only where his uh, activism comes from, and his love of the land of Israel and love of the Jewish people, and also his intelligence and his love of culture. I, I know when I speak to others from the former Soviet Union, culture is a, on a completely different level than what some of us um, from the colonies might consider culture. And I, and I understand why, because uh, that's very much something that you and others who came from the former Soviet Union have added here to Israel, the music, the science, the mathematics, and a level of culture that I don't think the country had before. So in this incredible in gathering of the exiles that we're having and everybody's bringing their peace, I would say that is a huge piece that the million or so people who came from the former Soviet Union have added tremendously to the mosaic of this old new land. And it's something that I personally am grateful for to the French for their food and to others for other things, but, uh, but very much so. And I got a little glimpse of that today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, I just want to add for the French yeah. that uh, food and fashion. For sure and fashion. Although when it's some of my kids have worked as waiters and they say the French don't tip well. So there's that other side of it as well. So <laughs> you see the difference. But definitely French and fashion and, of course, the beautiful language. Okay, so Dr. Fleischer, thank you so much. And uh, I will be back. Eve Harrow, Rejuvenation on the Land of Israel Network. I hope all of you enjoyed that and it whetted your appetite for more. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Take care, everybody. Goodbye for now. The question is, why are the Jews there in the first place? The Jewish people have been yearning to return to their ancient homeland for a long time. The Yishai Fleischer Show, the voice of a new generation of pro-Israel activists. And there's only two kinds of minorities in the Middle East, armed or unarmed. Inspiring minds to think differently. That jihadism doesn't just attack Jews. It attacks Christians, and it mostly attacks Muslims. Inspiration, spirituality, and politics. So first and foremost, this country is here to defend Jewish people and to live in its ancestral homeland. Listen to the Yishai Fleischer Show every week on the Land of Israel Network at the Land of Israel.